So this is the very last part of 5.4 part 2. And this relates to the last two questions on Tuesday's homework. And it talks about a unit vector. So the last thing we look at here is how do we take a vector that's not a unit vector and make it a unit vector? What that means is how do you make sure that a vector is exactly one unit in length? Well, that could mean a couple things. If it's too long, you're going to have to shorten it. If it's too short, you're going to have to lengthen it. But the goal is the same. Always want it to be one unit long. So let's look at a couple examples. So I'm going to give you a number for a length, and then I'm going to ask you what to scale by. Let's try it again. What to scale by to make it exactly one unit. Let's say I had a length of 5. If something was 5 units long, what would you scale it by to make it exactly 1 unit long? 5? Well, if it's 5 units long and you make it 5 times bigger, then it's going to be 25 units. Right? So if it's 5 and you make it 5 times as big, it's going to be 25 units. It's 5 units and we want to shrink it down to 1 unit. Yeah? Uh, one fifth. One fifth. And hopefully you'll start to see a pattern between the length and the number that you scale by. Um, what if you had a vector that was three units long? What would you scale that by to make sure that it was one unit? Yeah? One third. Yep, yeah, one third. What if you had a vector that was a quarter of a unit? You'd have to scale that by how much? Four. Four. Yep. So now, let's say we had a vector that was x units long. Look at the number that's on the left, and look at what you always do to it to get the number on the right. If it was x units, does anyone know what you would scale it by? Um, the number here and the number here are not the same. So if you put x here, you don't want to put x here. They're not going to be the same number. Yeah. One, over x. One over x. That's the pattern. If you have a vector and you want to make sure that it is one unit long, you scale it by one divided by its length. Let me write that down. So what we're doing is we're finding a new vector that still points the same way. It's just going to make sure that it's one unit. So it might be like these two vectors right here. Maybe the red vector is a unit vector. So we took the black one and we shortened it down to make it one unit long. And so that's what we're doing. Finding a new vector that points the same way, but it's only one unit long. And I'll write down what you guys just said from the from the chart that we made. To do that, you have to scale it by one over its length. That's what I'll write down next. So, to do this, you want to scale the vector by 1 divided by its length. Scale the vector by 1 over the length. That's how you do it. So if the vector was 4 units long, you scale it by 1 over 4. If the vector was 6 units long, you scale it by 1 over 6. If the vector was a half a unit long, that's 1 over 2, 
you're going to scale it by 2 over 1. You're going to double it to make it 1. Once people have that, we'll try an example, and then that'll finish um, 5.4 part 2. And we can do one of the ones uh, Forty-five and forty-seven. Those were those are the last two in the homework that relate to this. So I'll I'll do forty-seven. And I think I had another one too. Uh, actually, that that one is forty-seven. Three i minus four j. Yeah. So that's number forty-seven. In the homework. So if you, want, if you want to do another one, we can do another. One. Well, let's start with. All right, so it says to find a unit vector for that vector. To do that, you need to scale the vector by 1 over its length. So that's the first thing you need to find. You need to find its length. Okay. Now, as a reminder, how you find the length of that vector. Think of that vector. Choose this. Okay, 3i minus 4j. That means you're going to go right 3, down 4. Start anywhere you want. Doesn't matter. Right 3, down 4. 2, 3, 4. Does it look like that vector is already one unit long? No. It's like, if it was one unit long, it would be like this. That's one unit. So it's definitely longer than one unit. We need to find out how long it is. And once we know how long it is, then we can scale. So to find out how long it is, we use the formula after we made a certain shape out of that. Does anybody remember what shape we made out of that? Mm -hmm. Made a triangle out of it? Just like this. And the goal is to find the length of that piece in black. Okay, that's your vector. Well, that's three. And that's four. That comes from two numbers that are right there. Three and five. So how would you what theorem do you use to get the length of the vector? Yep, Pythagorean theorem. So it's the square root of uh, what's four squared? 16. And what's 3 squared? 9. So Pythagorean theorem says you square these two numbers, you add them together, and then you take the square root. So what's the, um, what's the length of this vector? <laughs> so is it a unit vector? No, how long should it be if it's a unit vector? It should be how long? One. So what do you have to scale this by to shrink it down to one? Yep. You're going to scale it by one over the length. So now, take this vector and scale it by one fifth. And that, that's the answer. So the answer is... Basically, take vector v and find one fifth. That that's what you need to do. One fifth of v. So that's going to be one fifth. And then we've got shall write it like this: three i minus four j. Okay. Just distribute out for one fifth. So what am I going to get for my number in front of i? Three fifths, yep, three fifths, sorry. And what about in front of J? Minus four fifths. Yep. 
and that's the answer. So it's the same vector you started with, it's just one fifth the size, and that's what you needed to do. And that was number 47 in the homework. Any questions on, on that one? Okay, so I looked at the test. There's a couple of those problems on the test. Does anyone want to see one more like that? Let's do one, um, right, let's take, what was that, example three, let's just call that 3A. Let's call this 3B. Um, 5I plus 12J. Okay, first thing we want to do is find the length. This time I'm not going to draw it with Pythagorean theorem. Let's just use the numbers. And the square root without without a sketch. Okay, so there's my graph. What does, what does that symbol mean again? You put the double bars around it. Yep, it means a magnitude. It's just how long it is. If we find the length of this is already one, then we don't have to do anything. It already is a unit of But that's not going to. Okay. So how would I do Pythagorean theorem uh, with the 5 and the 12? Yep. So it's 169 units long? You got to take the square root. So 5 squared, 12 squared, gives me the square root of 169. And uh, that does come out nice. 13. So we know how long it is now. It's 13 units long. Is that a unit vector? No. No. What do we have to scale it by to make it a unit vector? 1 13. So it's 13 times too big. We're going to make it 13 times smaller. So basically just divide each one of these by 13. So the answer is Take this component, multiply it by 1 13th, and then take the 12 and multiply it by 1 13th. So we just divided the vector by 13, basically. That's how you find a unit vector. Okay, question or not? The last thing we're going to look at um, is what's called the dot product. And the dot product is a way we can multiply two vectors together. Okay, what, what does that do for you? Well, it does this. If you want to know what the angle is between two vectors, the dot product is one way to figure it out. So that's going to be the whole goal of today. Find this angle between two vectors. Right, so first thing is when you want to write down dot product, okay, there's a symbol for it. And the symbol they use for a dot product is a dot. So if you want to find a dot product between two vectors, let's say just making these up, B and W, that's what you would see on paper. That means to do V dot W. So you'll always see a dot between the two letters. And yes, you do have to put the dot. You can't write this. The reason you can't write that is because when you're talking about vectors, there's two different ways to multiply. There's what's called a dot product, and there's also what's called a cross product. Cross product is something we, we don't study. But since there are two different ways to multiply vectors together and they're completely different, you have to write down which one you want the person to do. So you're always going to see the dot, not the cross. Right, so let's look at how you do it. Well, first of all, to do a dot product, you need to have two vectors. When we do 
an actual problem. It's going to look something like this. I'm going to give you numbers for the I's and J's. In the formula, I'm just representing those numbers with A's and B's. Okay, A1 and B1 could be any, any numbers. So vector V has a horizontal component and a vertical component. And so does vector W. A2 is the horizontal component. B2 is the vertical. Now remember, A1, A2, B1, and B2, those are all numbers. And we do an actual problem. So here's how you find uh, the dot product. Very simple formula. So to find the dot product, the first thing you have to do is take the number that I just circled, take the other number I just circled, and multiply them together. That's the first thing. Then, you're going to add, and let me show you what you're going to add. You're going to take that number that I just circled, take that number I just circled, and multiply those together. And that's how you find a dot product. So you multiply the two numbers that are in front of I together, two numbers that are in front of J together, and then add them up. So when you do a dot product, the kind of answer that you're going to get is a number. You might get 7, 6, 5, negative 8. But you're going to get a number when you do the dot product. Could be a fraction too, but it is going to be a number. No, you're multiplying. Because they're right, when you put the two letters next to each other like that, that's the multiplication. Yep. So you're going to multiply the two A's together, the two B's together, and then add them. So here's an example with, um, with numbers. So the first vector they give us is 2i minus 3j. And the second vector is 5i plus 3j. Find the dot point. Okay, so what I usually do is I set it all up like this. So we got four things we need to fill. Okay, uh, what's going to go in the first parenthesis? Two. Remember, we want to follow the order. The B comes first, W comes second. So the number from B comes first, the number from W comes second. What's going to go in the um, second parenthesis? Five. Five. So that's the first one here, first one here. Um, my third parenthesis. Negative three. And my last parenthesis. Three. three. Okay, so now we're going to multiply them together and see what we get. So two times five is ten. Negative three times neg negative three times positive three is negative nine. So what do I get for a dot product? Now, if you drew those two vectors and you're trying to find the angle between them, that one is going to help you do it. We'll try that in a little bit. But that's how you find the dot. Any question? All right. Let's try it this way. So the difference is now the W comes first and the V is second. So let's see what happens. Okay, so when you write this one, the number from the W should come first, and the B should come second. 
So what's going to go in my first parenthesis this time? Five? Yep. And the second one? Two. So that's going to be a two. W first, V second. And then how about my next two? Three and negative three. So if you look at that, you're going to see the dot product is the same as the last one. Okay, um, so what did we just say about uh, the dot product we get with this one? Same. It's the same. Does anybody remember the name for that in math? When you switch the order, you multiply two things in, and you still get the same answer? Like 5 times 2, 2 times 5? So it's it's usually one you learn with that one. It's not the associative, but it's the other one. Commuting. So those two examples we just did, it doesn't really prove anything, um, but it shows you a specific example of how the dot product is commutative, and it is always commutative. It doesn't matter what numbers you use. So v dot w is the same as w dot v. All right, let's try this one. So this is v dot v. So you don't you don't need w for this one. You're just dotting v with itself. So pretend like the two numbers that you have right here would be the same two numbers you have right here. It's the same same vector. Okay. So if I was going to do v dot v, what would be the first two numbers I multiply together? Two and what? Yep, 2 times 2. And the next two numbers? Negative 3 and negative 3. And 2 times 2 is going to give me? And negative 3 times negative 3? 9. So the dot product is? Dot product is 13. Any question on that? Right, let's try this one. So it's another uh, another dot product. It's written a little differently. It doesn't use the ij notation. It uses the one we learned before that. So, Tony, if I was going to find the dot product here, what would be the first two things I multiply together? Two zero. Yep, two zero. So, two times zero. Plus, uh, what would come after it? Uh, six times zero. Six times zero. And what do we get for a dot product here? Zero. So, the dot product between those two vectors is zero. And zero means something special. We'll talk about what zero means. Questions on All right, so one property that still works exactly the same as it does with other letters and numbers is the distributive property. If you have a dot product and you have a sum or a difference inside here, you can distribute that u as a dot product to each one. So the distributive property does work with dot. It's exactly the way you normally would do the distributive property. Except you'd have a dot product you'd have to do here the way I just showed you, and then another dot product the way I showed you, and then you'd have to add the two together when you were done. It's almost like you do two problems.
All right, so how do we find the angle between two vectors? Well, um, let me draw something and then we'll, uh, we'll take a look. Let's take... So we had a vector like that, and another vector, I don't know, like that. And I want to know what this is right here. Well, one way we could do it um, is we could turn that into a, a shape. Right now, it's not really a shape, it's just two vectors. But what, what shape do you think I could turn this into? Yeah, to make it a triangle, how would you do that? Yeah. Just connect those two. And we could figure out the length of each one of these sides if we wanted. This one's easy, that one's two. And then these other ones, well, if I thought of it like this, I could do Pythagorean theorem on this red side on the bottom. That's four. That's one. So how long would that red side be on the bottom? Square root of 17. Square root of 17. And I think the top one is the same. Just the way I drew it, it looks, uh, it looks symmetrical. Um, that doesn't always happen. But the point now is you've got something like this. Side, side, side. We talked about how to find angles in a side, side, side triangle before. It was a certain certain law. There were two laws we learned. Anybody remember which which law you can use on this one? Yep. You can use the law of cosines to figure out this angle or any angle you want. Now, there's an easier way than the law of cosines. And the easier way is going to use the dot. So let me show you how you can find this angle without having to draw the third side or find the lengths or anything like that. Okay. Not that that wouldn't work. That would work. But there's an easier way. So to find the angle between two vectors, if you don't want to use the law of cosines in the triangle method, there, there's three things you have to find. First thing you need is the dot product. That's what I just showed you how to do. The second thing you need is the magnitude of the first vector, and then the magnitude of the second. So that's the formula to find the angle between two vectors. The cosine of your angle equals the dot product over the product of the magnitudes. And if you don't remember what magnitude means, it just means length. Okay, so we'll try a, a few examples finding an angle between two vectors. What we're going to do, I think we'll draw these two vectors just to get an idea of what they look like. Maybe estimate the angle just by, by I. And then we'll do it using the formula and see, see how close we are. Okay, so let me use this. So we've got the vector 4i minus 3j. So 4i minus 3j means right 4, down 3. 
two, three, four. Down three. There's one. And the next vector is right two, up five. Two, up five. Okay, so now look at, look at that. And what would you estimate that to, to be about? And it's definitely bigger than 90. Maybe it's 95, 100, you know, maybe 104, I don't know. Somewhere between probably 95 and 105. Okay, let's see if we can find out what it is exactly. Okay, first thing I need is the dot product. So, Cameron, what are the first two things I multiply to get the dot product? Four and two. And uh, Sam, next two things I multiply? Negative three and five. Negative three and five. It's going to give me eight minus 15, which gives me a dot product of negative 7. Okay, so there's the first thing we need. Um, now I need the length of u. What's the first thing we should always write down when we're finding the length of something? So we don't we don't forget the symbol. Okay. Square root. Yep, I'll always put down the square root first so you don't forget to do it after. What's the first number that I'm going to square? 4, and that's going to give me 16. Okay, next number? So we square negative 3, and that gives me positive 9. Yeah. 16 plus 9 is 25. I think we did this earlier. What's square root of 25 is 5. Okay, so that's the second thing I need. And third thing, magnitude of v. Okay, uh, Ryan, what's the first number that I'll square? Uh, four. So I square two. I'll square two. And get four. four. You'll square five, get four five. Square five, you get 25. Square to 29. Okay, now fill those three numbers into those three spots in the floor. Okay. What, um, what trig function goes on the left side? Yeah. So it's always cosine equals. Okay. What's going to go in the top? Negative seven, that's your dot product. And what's going to go in the bottom? 5 times the square root of 29. Okay, now the goal is we're trying to find this angle. So we need to get rid of cosine. So what do we do on each side that will get rid of cosine? Inverse cosine. And once we do that, should have your answer for how big that angle is. If you're going to type it all in in one step, you've got to be a little careful with um, parentheses. So let's do inverse cosine, negative 7, then hit divided by. And now you want to put the denominator in parentheses because there's more than one number in the bottom. Like this. 5 square root 29. Close it and close it. Just like that. If you do not put parentheses around the 5 square root of 29, uh, order of operations, it's going to take the negative 7 and divide by 5 first, and then multiply the answer by square root of 29. Uh, that's not what you want. Okay, and remember what we said. It's about maybe 95 to 105, somewhere in there. And that's exactly what we got. That angle is 105 
0.07 degrees. And that's how you find an angle between two values. Any question on how I got that angle? Now, 105, there's nothing, nothing special about it. That's just, just kind of a random angle. There is an angle that two vectors could meet at, and it would be a special angle. Anybody think of an angle two vectors would meet at, and it might be considered something special? Yeah, 90. That's one of them. So, if two vectors are perpendicular, that means that they meet at a 90 degree angle. Something like that. Well, the word that they use to describe two vectors being perpendicular is orthogonal. When we talk about it, I don't really care if you just say the word perpendicular. It's just if you see this word in the homework or on the test, it means perpendicular. You might also see a symbol for perpendicular from geometry. It's like an upside down capital T. And what if we just say that would be? If they're perpendicular, the angle between them is how much? 90. 90. The angle would be 90. Okay. I'm going to show you a quick way to figure out if the angle is 90 without going through the whole formula to find the angle. Okay, there's a faster way than that formula if you're looking for 90. Okay, so let's think about that. Here's our formula. Just copy this down from the other page. If the vectors are perpendicular, we already know the angle. This angle would be 90. I don't know what the dot product would be. I don't know what the magnitudes would be because I don't have an actual problem. But if you're telling me the two vectors are perpendicular, I already know this number would be a 90. Do you want to do with that? Okay. Well, let's type in cosine of 90 on the calculator and see what you do. Cosine of 90 is 0. So if two vectors are perpendicular, this entire side. When you take the cosine of 90, it would turn into 0. So now you have this. You've got a fraction equal to 0, if they're perpendicular. What's the only way that a fraction can ever equal 0? Or what's the only way that you can divide one number by another number and get 0 as the answer? Yep. The top number has to be 0. And what do we have in the top of the fraction that I just circled? UV. And that, how do you pronounce that? Uh, U dot V. Yes, the dot product. So if you find the dot product between two vectors and it comes out to 0, that's enough information to tell you that the vectors are perpendicular. That's all you have to find. So if two vectors are, and I use the symbol for perpendicular, then their dot product is zero. So very, very quick way to figure out if vectors are perpendicular. So let's look at two vectors and see if they are perpendicular. And then we'll finish up with the last thing, which is something you usually study when you study perpendicular. Grady, what's the first two numbers I'm going to multiply together to get my dot product? Two and one. Yep, two times one. Two 
times one. And the next two numbers I'm gonna multiply together. Um would it be um be uh, one and two? One and two. Okay, so if we do that out, um, what do I get for my doubt product? Four. Four. So the answer to this question is not four. This is a yes or no question. Are these vectors perpendicular? What's the answer? No. The dot product would have had to come out to what? It would have had to come out to zero. It didn't come out to zero. So the answer to the question is no. So now, what if I asked you, what could you change? You can only change one thing, and I want to make those vectors perpendicular. What could you change, and then, it, and then they would be? Yeah? Yeah. Basically, if you make any one of these a negative, that would work. Or make that a negative, that a negative, or that a negative. But if you make one of them a negative, then your dot product would be zero. Okay. So that's perpendicular. What else do you usually look at? Like in algebra or any other class, when you do perpendicular, there's usually some other thing you look at with it. Um, not, no, not length. Something else there, yeah? Okay, so some, another type of angle that will give you something special. 90 is perpendicular, but there's another angle that will give you something else that's special. Yeah? Parallel. Parallel. What do you think the angle would be if two vectors are parallel? 180, yep, that would look like this. You're like, wait, how's that 180? Well, think of it this way then. Two vectors that point in opposite directions. This has an angle of 180. There's another angle that that would make them parallel as well. Zero. Zero would look like this. Or if that looks confusing, just imagine the two arrows like this then, right on top of each other. So these are the two cases that cause you to end up with parallel vectors. Zero degree, 180 degrees. Let's see if there's a trick like we just did for perpendicular. So here's, my, here's my formula. And let's start with the 180. So if you're telling me that the two vectors are pointing in opposite directions, then you're telling me the angle is 180. Well, let's see what happens if we plug in 180 on the left-hand side. Cosine of 180 is negative 1. So I get this. That is one situation for parallel. So how can that happen? How can you divide two things and have the answer come out to negative one? Right, you're dividing, so you're really dividing opposites. Then, right? If you divide two things that are opposites, you get negative one. But the problem with that is you would have to know the number that's in the top and you have to know the number that's in the bottom. To know if they're opposites. You can't just know the one in the top and not the bottom and say, oh yeah, they're opposites. We don't know both. So the downside to doing it with parallel, you need to know both. Find the top, find the bottom, and see if they come out opposite. If they do, then you're parallel with 180. Let's see what happens with zero. So I'm going to take the same formula and just fill in zero. Again, I don't know the dot product, I don't know the magnitudes, but if you're telling me they point the same way, I know the angle between them is zero. Let's take the cosine of zero. 
positive one. So two vectors point the same way. We would end up with one on the left and all this stuff on the right. Tyler, how could this happen? So you've got a fraction equal to one. So how can you divide two numbers and have it come out to one? They'd have to be the same. So in this case, they had to be opposites. In this case, they have to be the same. But in order for you to know if the top and the bottom are the same, you need to know the top and the bottom. So you can't get away with just doing one. Okay. So it does take a little bit more work to figure out if they are parallel. So we already said that. So let's try again. There's a question here again. It's yes or no. Determine if the vectors are parallel. Either yes, they are, or no, they're not. All right. So if we're going to figure out if they're parallel, what's the first thing that we need to find that goes in the top of the fraction? Yep, we need the dot. Let me just move it up. Okay. Um, Curtis, we're going to be the first two things I multiply together to get my dot. Four and twenty. Mm -hmm. Four and twenty. And Dominic, the next two things. Uh, negative five and negative twenty-five. Negative five, negative twenty-five. Okay, 4 times 20 is going to give me how much? 80. And negative 5 times negative 25, well, that's positive. It's 125. So my dot product is 205. Now, I'm not able to answer the question if they're parallel yet, but because the dot product came out to 205, I can tell you something that they're not. What are they definitely not in this case? They are not perpendicular, because remember the dot product would have to be zero. The dot product's not zero. So are they parallel? Well, I don't know yet. They're not perpendicular. Okay, um, what's the next thing I need after I get the dot product? Yeah. Yep, I need the lengths. I need this length, and I need W. We start with the square roots. What are going to be the two numbers that I add up um, underneath the square root to find the length of the 16 and 25, which is 41. All right. And for W. Uh, first number is 20 squared, which is how much? That's 400. And how about 25 squared? Six twenty five, yeah. And when we add those up, we get 1,025. Okay. Let's set up our formula and remember what we're hoping for if they're parallel. We're either hoping that these come out opposites or they come out the same. Okay. So, 
cosine of my angle equals what goes at the top? And, excuse me, and the bottom. Yep. So there's only one way these are going to come out to parallel. What would the bottom have to be if they're going to be parallel? Yep. It would have to come out to 205. It can't come out to negative 205 because it's a positive times positive. So it's going to be a positive. But does it come out to positive 205? Well, let's see. So you got square root 41 times square root of 1025 gives me 205. And at this point, we can stop because we know we're dividing two numbers that are the same. That's going to give me a 1, which means the angle between them is 0. And if the angle is 0, that means they are parallel. So the answer here is yes. They are parallel. That's how you determine if vectors are parallel or perpendicular. Any questions on that? Okay, so that covers everything that's going to be on the um, on the test. The test is 12 questions. It's a little bit shorter because we only did uh, really two sections this week. We did half a section Monday, half Tuesday, and then a full section today. Okay. So, in the homework, um, on question 7 to 17, each question has three parts. The first part says find the dot product. Second part, I think the second part says find the angle, which you need the dot product for anyway. And then the third part asks you if they're parallel, perpendicular, or neither. So once you know the angle, if it doesn't come out to 0, 90, or 180, well, then it's neither parallel or perpendicular. If it comes out to 0 or 180, parallel. If it comes out to 90, perpendicular. Okay, so I'm going to pause that, and then I'll put the topics for the, um, the test in the, in the video. Okay, you've got about 20 minutes or so, so if there's any questions or anything you want to check in with me about, now would be a good time.